The constitutional right for Americans to freely express our views is under attack. It's under attack from laws that require nonprofit organizations to subject their donors to public scrutiny. North Carolina lawmakers could and should proactively reject this intimidation tactic that invades donors' privacy for political gain. That is the thrust of a new report published by the John Locke Foundation and authored by John Guzet, who is the Director of Legal Studies. And John joins us now to talk about some key themes from this report. John, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Donna. All right. So I think... um, I'm sure all of our listeners and you and I have at one point or another made a charitable donation to some sort of nonprofit group. So people might be wondering, well, what's the big deal, John? Um, What is the big deal if it becomes public that, say, uh, Donna Martinez donated money to a um, a cancer group? organization or some sort of mental health organization. Why is that an issue? Well, there's lots of reasons why donors might want to keep their uh, their giving private. I mean, one reason, for example, is simply some people have a religious objection. They feel that it's not the same if they if, if, if people know what that they're giving. Another reason people want to maintain some kind of privacy is because once people know they're giving, then other people will come and ask them for money. There's lots of reasons why people want to keep their donations private, and they're all legitimate, and they'd all be undermined by some of the donor disclosure um, regulations and rules that are going into effect around the country. But the reason, the reason that there's one reason for donor privacy that I think is most important, and that is that if you give money to an organization that other people disapprove of, you can get. Um, private retaliation. You could lose your job. If you own a business, you could be boycotted. You could have pickets out in front. Um, You might just get lots of death threats uh, through social media. There's all kinds of very unpleasant consequences to having it known that you've given money to an organization that expresses views that are unpopular. And because of that, these donor disclosure laws have the effect of suppressing unpopular views from the um, public forum. And that's what we want to, uh, that we don't want that to happen because free expression of ideas is important to the whole system of government that we have. It's important to a free society. So we will want laws that make people afraid to express themselves. It sounds as if really the issue comes in the public policy arena. And also the issue being that if someone wants their name to be public and doesn't care, and that's their choice, no problem. But what we're talking about here with these laws and this movement is to use government power to require that names be released to the public, whether the donor or the organization thinks that's a good idea or not. Is that a fair characterization of where we are? I think that's right, although uh, some of these laws don't expressly say it's going to be made public. In fact, sometimes the agency that's promulgating the laws will claim that they're going to keep it private. The problem is they often don't, and they probably can't in this day and age. State uh, state databases just aren't that secure. In California, for example, where a lot of these cases that we may talk about come from, it came out at trial that uh, despite the uh, state claim that they were going to keep this information private, several times lists of donors were um, uh, exposed on online. And uh, when one of the people who were challenging these laws hired a hacker to go in and get it, he had no trouble at all getting lists of all the people who were giving money in California. So the Sometimes some of these laws expressly say we're going to reveal it to the public. Some of them say we're not. Either way, though, it has a chilling effect because people know that that information isn't secure and they don't want people to know which organizations they're giving money to. John, is this a nationwide movement from state to state? Are there organized actors behind the scenes who are working with lawmakers who are friendly to this idea of mandatory uh, public disclosure to try to... um, essentially enact these laws uh, state by state by state? Well, there clearly is. Um, what we, we see, it it all started around the same time, which was after the Citizens United decision was handed down in the Supreme Court. This is being um, advertised as part of the way to get dark money out of politics. Um, and there's a lot of talk about shining the light of sunshine, public disclosure, the public's right to know, and so on and so forth. Of course, these donations aren't for electioneering. So Citizens United doesn't really have any bearing on this, even if you don't like that decision. But um, 
what we saw is very soon, st- one state after another started doing this, and they used the, the people promoting it in the state legislatures, the state's attorneys general who were um, promulgating these kinds of rules used exactly the same language from one state to the other, and they used exactly the same mechanism. So I'm quite sure there is a coordinated movement, um, mostly on the left, although there have been some states in which Republicans have done this too, to uh, mandate donor disclosure for the express purpose of suppressing speech they don't like. Now, I know that um, you are concerned, and this is um, written about in your report, which, by the way, is called Protecting Donor Privacy in North Carolina. And you can read this report written by our guest, John Guzay, at johnlock.org. And, John, in a minute here, we're going to talk about a couple of states that have really pushed back against this effort, and two states that you are urging North Carolina policymakers to take a look at in terms of taking steps to protect donor privacy here in our state. But let's talk first about a landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision that uh, happened in the late 1950s, NAACP versus Alabama, which some folks thought really uh, decided this issue and decided it um, against mandatory disclosure of donors, but apparently it did not. Tell us about that case. Well, it's an interesting case, and it's sort of emblematic of this whole thing. When you have an entrenched political establishment and no real opposition within the state, that's when you can have these kinds of laws. And what happened in the South during the 50s when the NAACP was starting to win some victories and push back against, successfully push back against state laws that mandated legal uh, discrimination against African Americans, uh, since the, the segregationists were losing in court, they decided to try a different ploy, and it was donor disclosure. All over the South, from one end to the other, uh, either by, in some cases by having laws passed by the legislature, but often states, states' attorneys general would simply say, we're going to start requiring that nonprofits operating in our state, or sometimes even explicitly the NAACP can't operate in our state until they turn over to us a list of all their supporters. Now, there's no question that at that time, being known to be a supporter of the NAACP put you at risk. There were there was plenty of harassment, and people didn't want to do it. In fact, from the when they started in Alabama, no, actually, in the South as a whole, once those laws went to effect, over the course of two years, the NAACP's donations dropped by 50 percent. Oh so my. it was a huge blow. Um, in Alabama, they fought back. The NAACP fought back. They took it through the state courts and then to the federal courts. And when it reached the U.S. Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, you can't do this. The Constitution protects what they called the right to association and to associate for, the, uh, for private purposes. And the way this law is being applied in, in Alabama, it, it uh, violates the Constitution, and they struck it down. So, John, I'm not an attorney. You are. But for my, to my ear, as someone who's not a legal expert, I learned in school that the United States Supreme Court was the law of the land, and if there was a ruling that said, no, this type of thing is unconstitutional, that states couldn't then do that. So how is it that we are seeing this movement now for these uh, mandates, these laws that require donor disclosure, if we have NAACP versus Alabama in place? Well, there's several reasons why that, that decision didn't put a stop to this sort of thing once and for all. One reason is because it was an as-applied decision. They said, this law is unconstitutional as it applies to the NAACP in Alabama in 1958. And they specifically cited some of the harassment I talked about. So that, in in itself, that would undermine the law to a large extent because it gave future federal courts the opportunity to say, well, the situation facing some other organization in some other state in the 2000s is different. And so we can distinguish it. Therefore, the as-applied decision that the Supreme Court handed down in 1958 doesn't apply now. Another reason is this, for reasons that aren't quite clear to me, well, I think I can explain it, but what happened in this case, my feeling is that these laws, donor disclosure, it makes people afraid to exercise rights that are specifically enumerated in the U.S. Constitution. They're specifically enumerated in the North Carolina Constitution. And those rights are freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, the right to assemble, and the right to petition the government for a redress of grievances. These are very specific, fundamental rights that are uh, 
enumerated in state and federal constitutions. But instead of focusing on them, in NAACP versus Alabama, the Supreme Court referred mostly to a, uh, a right that doesn't appear anywhere in any of these constitutions, and that's the right to association. That's one of these rights that, as happened so often in the 40s and 50s, the Supreme Court sort of created. Uh, out of, uh, they found it in a penumbra, or they found that it was implicit in some of the other rights that are express, expressly guaranteed under these constitutions, and they focused on that. Now, it might not be obvious why that's important, but it is be for this reason. Um, Another thing the Supreme Court did, starting all the way back in the 1930s, was they created a hierarchy of rights. Uh, it's called the, um, it's a tiers of scrutiny system under which some rights are st strictly um, protected and others don't get much protection at all. And in NAACP versus Alabama, they're a little ambivalent about what level of scrutiny ought to apply. Really fundamental rights that the Supreme Court cares about they apply something called strict scrutiny to them. To pass strict scrutiny, the law has to be, it has to advance a, um, a compelling government interest and it has to be narrowly tailored so that it uh, accomplishes its goal in the least uh, intrusive way possible. At the other end of the tiers of scrutiny hierarchy um, is our economic rights like uh, uh, and, and property rights, these are protected which call on what's called the rational basis test. And what happens there is that if there's any possible rational justification for the law, it's upheld. In between, they've created various intermediate, intermediate levels of scrutiny. And one of these is what they call um, exacting scrutiny. They've, they started applying this to cases like uh, involving things like donor disc um, in, uh, campaign disc uh, contributions. In NAACP versus Alabama, they were a little ambivalent. At, at one point, they say these kinds of disclosure laws should receive the highest level of scrutiny. But elsewhere, they said all we need to show is that there's what, – what, what Alabama needs to show is that there's some kind of uh, um, important interest that can be advanced by this law. And they said there wasn't in the case of this one. So, John, if NAACP versus Alabama really doesn't control on this issue, like we might think based on, on the ruling for the reasons that you have described so eloquently here, that then seems to open the door for this movement uh, in states to pass laws that would require it. Now, we've got a couple of states that you write about in your report available at johnlock.org. The state of Mississippi, the state of West Virginia, they have pushed back against this. And you, in your report, urge North Carolina lawmakers to take a look at what these two states have done in order to now take steps to protect our rights here in our state. Tell us about Mississippi and West Virginia what they've accomplished? Well, what these laws apply to are, let me, let me step back for just a second and say there's, there's really two ways that uh, donor, donor privacy can be attacked. One is through a state law that requires donor disclosure. Now, the only way to stop those, barring some change of heart at the Supreme Court, is for the voters in the state to in, let their legislators know that we don't want those kinds of laws in our state. But the other way, and the more common way this happens, is the way it happened in Alabama in 1958, and that's for a state attorney general or some other administrative officer to simply demand that uh, nonprofits disclose donor information. That's what, as I say, that's what happened in Alabama. That's what happened more recently in New York. It happened in California. Eric Schneiderman did it in New York, and Kamala Harris did it in California. They just simply said, we're going to start requiring all you nonprofits to turn over your list of donors. The state legislature didn't pass a law that said it. The state attorney general said it. The, kind, the laws that were passed in Mississippi and West Virginia, and I have to say, since I wrote that report, another similar law um, has been approved in Oklahoma. All three of those laws say that they, they say that a state attorney general or no, no officer of the state can do that. So that's a big, important step forward because that stops the most common way this is done, which is not through legislation at the state level, but through independent action by a uh, administrative officer. Is that your recommendation for North Carolina? Absolutely. I mean, this, if we have a law like this, it will certainly mean that no rogue attorney general or any other officer of the state in North Carolina can start demanding this kind of disclosure. It won't stop the General Assembly from passing its own disclosure law sometime in the future, but 
Uh, it will certainly let state legislators know where their predecessors stood, and um, it'll give the citizens something to point to when they say, we don't want disclosure laws here. John, as we move forward, and uh, hopefully we start having a, a very substantive discussion about this in our state legislature, I know your report is going to be um, key for lawmakers to review. Again, it's called Protecting Donor Privacy in North Carolina, available at johnlock.org. But there might be some legislators or activists who say, you know what, this really isn't that big a deal, and you're talking about theory in terms of the potential retaliation against someone. And that that may just uh, never really happen. But in your report, you actually reference that there are real-world examples of the terrible retaliation that some people in this country have faced when it became public that they were donating to a nonprofit group whose views were either in the minority or unpopular. Well, what we see we see this happen all the time. I can't believe anybody isn't aware of the extent to which this happens. If you are found to have expressed an unpopular view in any way, in an old tweet, if you gave money to a campaign or a, 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 a referendum that um, the political correct majority doesn't approve of, this gets people in trouble. We've seen people lose their jobs. We've seen people um, uh, subjected to death threats. We've had there's plenty of examples of people having uh, graffiti painted on their houses. Businesses have been boycotted. Everybody knows this happens. Anytime um, the public finds out that you've expressed an unpopular view, we can't stop all of that, but we can certainly stop some of it. And this is a particularly important place to put a stop to it because giving money to an organization that uh, amplifies your ability to get your, view, your views out into the um, public forum is important. And uh, we don't want to take away that absolutely vital way for expressive freedom.